Hello and welcome. Now in a previous video, we took a look at how to find local extreme values of a function of two variables. So you can think about a surface where z equals f of x, y, and maybe you want to find out where it has a local minimum or a local maximum. And you can find critical points by using the gradient, but you had to use the second partial derivatives test to classify those critical points as a local minimum or a local maximum, or maybe a saddle point. Now, in the second partial derivatives test, it kind of makes sense that you're using second derivatives, probably because it's kind of familiar from single variable calculus. It's just like concavity in a way, but it is a little bit more involved. And we actually had to invent this term called the discriminant of the function to help us to classify saddle points versus extreme points. Now, where did that all come from? In this video, we're going to take a look at how you can approximate a surface using a quadratic and then that kind of leads us into where the discriminant comes from and how the second partial derivatives test work and it kind of starts back in single variable calculus first of all now in single variable calculus we started by approximating a curve by a linear function it's just basically the tangent line but then we got something even better so let's take a look, first of all, at how we did linear approximation back when we had single variable calculus. Now you might remember the formula for the linearization of f. If we have y equals f of x and we want to linearize the function at x equals a, then we called it L of x and the formula was f prime of a times x minus a plus f of a, which is essentially just the equation of the tangent line to f at x equals a. Now, later on in single variable calculus, after we had kind of learned a bit more about series, we found that we could actually approximate a function by using a polynomial of any degree we want. And that's from the Taylor series approximation formula. And that Taylor series approximation formula is a series that starts at n equals zero and goes on forever, where the nth term is the nth derivative of f evaluated at a divided by n factorial times x minus a to the power n. And here I've just written out the first couple terms. When n equals zero, we just have f of a, because zero factorial is one, and anything to the power of zero is one, so there's f of a. And our second term, that'd be the first derivative of f evaluated at a, one factorial is one, and then we have x minus a to the power one. And you can see how the first two terms here of the Taylor series actually do perfectly match up with the linearization formula. But Taylor series continue onward, and in the next term, where n is equal to 2, we would have the second derivative of a over 2 factorial, which evaluates as 2, and we have a factor of x minus a squared. And that's a quadratic term. And the moment you have a quadratic in there, then the shape becomes a parabola. And it gives us a better idea about whether or not this function is concave up or concave down. Now, if we were to stop the Taylor series approximation formula at n equals two, we'd have an even better approximation of y equals f of x. Now we could maybe say that f of x is approximately q of x, q for quadratic, let's say. And that would be equal to the first three terms of the Taylor series, leading all the way up to a power of two. Now you get an idea that this isn't just a tangent line, it's a parabola that has roughly the same shape of the function f of x near x equals a. And let's just go back to calc one here for a moment and think about how we did optimization. We had to find critical numbers where the derivative was equal to zero or where the derivative was undefined. Now, if the derivative equals zero, then we at least have a horizontal tangent line, and that could be where we have a minimum or a maximum, or potentially it's neither. You'd have to kind of test that using the second derivative test. And from this formula, you can kind of see how that second term, it has f prime of a in it. Well, if f prime of a equals zero because a is a critical number, then that term goes away and you're left with the parabola and you just have to determine at that vertex where x equals a whether it's opening up or opening down so maybe that kind of helps explain the second derivative test a little bit now let's take this concept of a taylor polynomial and apply it to a polynomial in two variables 
that's going to give us a quadratic approximation to our f of x comma y now. Now you may remember the linear approximation formula for a function of two variables. f of x, y is approximately equal to the linearization L of x, y near the point x, y equals a, b. And that's given by this formula where we take the partial derivative of f with respect to x at the point a, b times x minus a. And then we have the partial derivative of f with respect to y at the point a, b times y minus b plus the function just evaluated at the point. And that's our initial z coordinate or the z coordinate at the point where x equals a and y equals b. Now, this formula gives us the tangent plane at a point. And we're going to extend that to get the quadratic approximation. And now, there's a little bit of a leap here, but it's pretty much the same kind of idea as what we did with the Taylor series for f of x. We're going to get all of these extra little second partial derivatives all of a sudden. With a quadratic approximation, let's go with q of x comma y. And we're going to start off with a constant and then we're going to have two linear terms just like we did with linear approximation these two linear terms rely on the first derivatives but as soon as we go to the second derivative remember that we get mixed partial derivatives we have f partial x x we have f y y but we also have mixed partial derivatives f x y and f y x that gives us four additional terms now in this particular quadratic approximation. They all have one half in front, and that's just one over two factorial. And then we have the second order partial derivatives evaluated at the point. And for every one of these, we have some kind of degree two, either that's x minus a squared, y minus b squared, or a combination of x minus a and y minus b. But every one of these four terms here does have a power of two. This is called the quadratic approximation formula for a function f of x, y. And you can continue this on and on. If you want to think about a Taylor polynomial of a function of two variables, it gets pretty complicated. It has a lot of terms in there. But it is just an extension of the Taylor series approximation from first year calculus. Now, here's a little bit of good news. Remember that when we we're looking for local extreme values, we were looking at critical points where the gradient of f at the point a, b was equal to zero. Now, if the gradient equals zero, that tells us that fx and fy at that point are both equal to zero, and the quadratic approximation does become just a tiny little bit simpler both of those linear terms are going to disappear. We're just going to have our constant and then three remaining terms that all have a degree of two. Now let's just try to simplify this down a little bit and maybe let's just let AB be the point zero, zero. Let's assume that we get a critical point right at the origin and simplify this down a little bit. Well then, this quadratic approximation is going to be equal to f of 0, 0. And that's just going to be some sort of z coordinate. It's just going to be a single number. Let's call that d. And then we're going to get plus 1 half fxx at the origin, which is going to be some number. Let's call that a. And then we would have x minus 0 squared, or just simply x squared. Now, the next term is pretty similar. We're going to have a number in front. Let's call it b. And then we'll just have x times y. And then we're going to have a third term with some number in front times y squared. So we'll call that number c. And so what we're really looking at is a, a surface of the form ax squared plus bxy plus cy squared plus d. Now when we simplify it like this, you can imagine that d is essentially just moving the graph up and down in the direction of positive or negative z. The other three terms, ax squared plus bxy plus cy squared, that's a quadratic. Now, we're kind of familiar with some quadratic graphs already, like z equals ax squared plus cy squared. Well, that might be an elliptic paraboloid, and we can determine if it's facing up or opening down just based on the signs of 
A and C. But it's sort of this middle term that might be a little confusing right now. It might not be a shape that you're commonly thinking of. We're going to have to go way, way back now and think about how you can kind of remove that middle term a little bit. And it's using a technique from pre-calculus. It's using completing the square. So brace yourself because when was the last time you probably completed the square? There's a couple tricks to remember with that technique. Now you can either complete the square using the variable x or using the variable y. We're going to complete the square using the variable x. And the first thing we do is we actually factor out this coefficient in front of the x square. We're going to factor out that a. Now, of course, brace yourself. We're going to get into some fractions. That leaves the leading coefficient inside the brackets as a 1 for the x squared, but we get two fractions, b over a and c over a. Okay, now we're supposed to do this clever little technique of adding and subtracting inside the brackets. We look at this middle term as being some stuff times x. That stuff here would be b over a times y. And we take that b over a times y, we take half of it, and then we square it. And we add and subtract that. And it's supposed to help us complete the square here. Okay, so b over a times y, if we take half of that, would be b over 2a times y. And we'll square it, we'll add it, and then we'll subtract it. That ensures that the value inside the brackets hasn't changed whatsoever. And then we still have one additional term plus c over a y squared. Okay, now we can all look at that and say that's pretty gross, but there was a point to this, right? Well, yeah, now we can actually look at those first three terms and that completes a square here for us. Those first three terms is going to actually get completed into just x plus b over 2ay all squared. Slightly better. And you can see that the two remaining terms, when you expand the brackets, both have y squared. So we can collect those two terms together. Well, that completing the square results in essentially just x shifted by a little bit of y all squared and then we have another term here of y squared now don't forget of course we have this extra little plus d here which only really just moves this particular function up or down in the direction of the z-axis but those three terms there really helps us to determine what kind of a shape this quadratic approximation looks like now stop and refresh yourself with a couple of the common quadratic shapes here. If we were to have z equals ax squared plus by squared, then there's really only three options. If a and b are both positive, then we have an elliptic paraboloid opening upwards. If a and b are both negative, we have an elliptic paraboloid opening downwards. Now, if a and b are opposite sides, then we can say that the product of a and b is negative. And if they're opposite sides, we have a hyperbolic paraboloid, which has kind of a saddle shape. Looking at what we have right here for our quadratic approximation, you might be able to see that really just depending on a's, b's, and c's here, we might get one of these three shapes. And these shapes at a critical point as the key to finding out if we have a local minimum, a local maximum, or a saddle point. If we have an elliptic paraboloid as our quadratic approximation opening upward at a critical point, well then that's going to be like sort of a bowl shape. And that bowl shape is a surface that has a local minimum at that critical point. Now if it's an elliptic paraboloid opening downward, then that's telling us that our surface kind of looks like a bowl at that critical point and a bowl in that case would have a local maximum now if it's a hyperbolic paraboloid if that's the best quadratic approximation that's telling us that it's slightly bent in both directions it's a little concave up it's a little concave down we end up with a saddle looking shape so we just call that critical point a saddle point now, let's see what tells us that in this particular quadratic equation. We have A's, B's, and C's that kind of unlock the goal here. Now, here in this quadratic approximation, kind of in its simplest form right now, we really just need to figure out whether or not the cross sections are parabolas opening up and down in the x and y different directions. Now, in this first particular case here, we have x plus 
some sort of coefficient of y all squared. And when we square all of that, we know that we're going to end up getting the coefficient of x being positive, but it would get affected by a in the front. So whatever a is, we need to maybe know if that is going to be positive or negative, and that's gonna help us to determine whether or not our x squared term is opening up or opening down. Now here in front of the y squared term, we have a little more interesting coefficient going on. The denominator, 4a squared is always positive, but the numerator could be positive or negative depending on whether or not a, b, and c are of certain kinds of values. So really the sign of the coefficient of x squared and the sign of the coefficient for y squared are determined by these two highlighted parts. Now let's look at this 4ac minus b squared. You might remember that 4ac minus b squared is the discriminant for a quadratic equation. Now, if we look a little bit more carefully, if the discriminant equals 4ac minus b squared, what the heck were a, b, and c? You can look back up here to where we actually just called something a, and it was 1 half f partial xx at the point a, b. So a is just equal to 1 half of fxx. All right, well, what was c? Looking back up here, c was the coefficient in front of this y minus b squared term. We were just letting b be zero. Well, that is 1 half fyy at the point a, b. All right, now, what here was b? Well, I just realized I actually made a little bit of a typo here. 1 half fxy and 1 half fyx would be the same, assuming that the second partial derivatives are continuous by Clairaut's theorem. But then for some reason, when I added them together, I've actually just called this fyy. That should be fxy or fyx. So that's a little typo there. But because fxy equals fyx by Clairaut's theorem, half of each of them added together should just add up to fxy. That's our coefficient b. So squaring that, we'd end up with fxy squared. Now we can simplify that a little bit because we have four times a half times a half and putting all of those coefficients together, that cancels all completely out and leaves us with one. So this simplifies to fxx fyy minus fxy squared. And that's the formula for the discriminant that we stated in the second partial derivatives test. You can maybe shortcut the notation here a little bit by writing it in the form of a determinant of a two by two matrix. Fxx, Fxy, Fyx, Fyy in a two by two determinant. That particular discriminant is going to tell us whether or not the coefficient of y squared is positive inside the square brackets. If that 4ac minus b squared is positive, in other words, if this discriminant formula is positive, then the coefficients of x squared and y squared would have the same sign. They could either both be positive or both be negative, depending on the sign of a. So that gives us sort of our first two cases of the partial derivatives test. If this discriminant is positive, then 4ac minus b squared in this little shorthand notation is positive, and this highlighted bit is going to give us a positive coefficient for y squared. And we have a positive coefficient for x squared, and then it's just a matter of whether a is positive or negative. If a is positive, then this quadratic approximation is essentially an elliptic paraboloid opening upward, and that gives us a local minimum at the point a, b equals zero, zero. So remember, this whole completing the square was a lot easier at the origin. It's still possible at other points, but let's maybe not get into that. If the discriminant is positive, then they have the same sign for x squared and y squared, but when a is negative, then it's an elliptic paraboloid opening downward. That just tells us that our surface kind of looks like a bowl opening downward at zero, zero, giving us a local maximum. And then we don't really have to test A if this 4AC minus B squared happens to be negative because right away our X squared term and our Y squared term are going to be of opposite sides. 
and as soon as they are of opposite signs, then the shape of this quadratic approximation would be a hyperbolic paraboloid. Now, a hyperbolic paraboloid kind of looks like a saddle. Some people might say it looks a little bit like a Pringles chip, and of course, that means we have a saddle point at the origin. Now, it's at this point in time that you maybe just have to remember, what was A again? <laughs> well, A, if we scroll back up here again, A was the coefficient one half of the second partial derivative fxx. Now, if A is positive, since one half is always positive, then fxx is positive. So testing the sine of fxx is the same as getting us the sine of A. And so basically, this completes the second partial derivatives test. The discriminant alone is enough to know whether or not the quadratic approximation looks more like a hyperbolic paraboloid, which is a saddle point, or if the quadratic approximation looks like an elliptic paraboloid, which is a bowl opening up or opening down. It was A that distinguished between opening up or opening down, and A is reliant on the sine of fxx. So that's why we test fxx as the other sort of determining factor of whether we get a local minimum or a local maximum. So there's a lot going on. You may not have expected to see Taylor series again, but a Taylor polynomial just doesn't stop with a single variable function. It continues on, and we're still only just looking at one more variable, f of x comma y. If you want to do this optimization technique with functions of even more variables, it does get a little more involved and uses a little bit more linear algebra. Constrained optimization, on the other hand, if we're looking to see whether or not we get an absolute maximum or an absolute minimum within a constrained domain, then we maybe don't use this method, in which case critical points are still useful, but the second partial derivatives test might not be the useful method of choice. It's really only good for looking for local extreme values. But hopefully this kind of fills in some of the gaps as to where the heck that second partial derivatives test come from. If you can understand all of this sort of background knowledge, then you have a really good understanding of where our first year calculus can really be expanded. And the idea of Taylor polynomials just kind of comes out of nowhere. Well, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.